Andra's three decades of experience in international business and engaging with Asian tiger economies is the foundation upon which he adds value to all businesses wanting to engage with the Asian century. Currently helping businesses and professional bodies understand the intricacies of the geopolitics of trade in a region dominated by China. These insights are shared in his books, China's Belt Road Initiative, The Challenge for the Middle Kingdom Through a New Logistics Paradigm, and as a contributing author, Digital Transformation of Logistics, Chapter 13, Exploring the Digital Silk Road. Please welcome Andre as he shares his insights on digital supply chain with us today. Welcome back to a look into digital supply chains. In today's episode, we're going to take a closer look at port operating systems as well as terminal operating systems and how the digitalization of these systems has led to an optimal optimization of cargo throughput within a port environment. We have three guests, Alex Clifton, who is a PhD candidate taking a close look at automation and particularly vehicle automation and its impact within a port ecosystem on cargo throughput. We also have Biju Kularam, who is a specialist in smart container movement and track and trace system based in Long Beach, California. And also we have Sylvia Wong, who is based in Canada, who is a digital head for Hatch and has been instrumental and has practical experience that she can share with implementing terminal operating systems within the North American environment. I do hope you find the episode enjoyable, but more importantly, I hope it gives you plenty of food for thought. Well, welcome back to, to, to our look at uh, port operating systems and, and, and Internet of Things within the digital supply chain. And I welcome uh, Alex Clifton, who is a PhD candidate, who with Edith Cowan University, who looks, who is looking at and researching how individual users of technology within the transport systems exchange that data and what they make of it. Uh, he's also he also has an MBA in supply chain, and really is a a person that looks at the on ground performance of vehicles, possibly with automation within a port system or a port ecosystem. So welcome, Alex, and and, and I hope you enjoy the chat. Uh, I'm certainly looking forward to, to, to sharing and, and learning from you today. Thank you. Alex, perhaps a starting point is within the digital supply chain, one of the uh, key areas for your supply chain to be, to be uh, efficient and optimized at port level is the degree of or the use of artificial intelligence and, and automation. To what extent do you think uh, the port systems or port operating systems have have contributed to this or where are they in terms of the development of a fully automated system? Um, in, in terms of uh, if, we, if we sort of split that up a little bit and look at um, the actual technology itself, for a start, the technology capabilities as a whole are only ever potential. And if we if we only use a fragment of it or choose not to use it, um, we, we you know we can't just take its engineering capabilities, what it might bring to us um, uh, as, as a given. So it's important to sort of bear that in mind whenever we um, discuss technology or, or um, things in, in that nature. And I think really technology adoption can can um, can can form many barriers um, to this, and this this is the, the the sort of behavioral science aspect from the from the human element now taking taking shape. Whilst the technology um, that's available out there um, can can offer wondrous things and and really only be limited by um, the developer's imagination, for example, uh, it really comes down to uh, operators. On a day-to-day -day basis, and and the foresight of, of management staff wanting to um, implement and, and adopt this technology, and I think that's really 
um, a key aspect to always bear in mind with with any form of technology across any any discipline. Um, we're, we're all a little bit guilty of this to a fair degree. Um, you know, we all carry smartphones pretty much now, but we only probably use 10% or certainly I do um, of, of that capacity. But that's the 10% I need. Um, but it's 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 the unknown really that that, that adds to this. Uh, compounds the problem with technology being deployed in this kind of role because uh, it, it, we don't always know what we do need and that that's another problem because we've not experienced or realized it there's there's this um, sort of pushback of this is how we've always done things and and that can restrict us heavily uh, and and certainly if we're looking at a logistics aspect and looking at port logistics for example um, that that would be no different. That's that's the same. Um, we're, we're all human beings at the end of the day, and that's that that change, that transition um, in recent years is, is is potentially coming faster and quicker each time. So I think that's that's a big thing. Just to remember that the the technology is only ever potential if we don't don't adopt it, don't use it, um, or only use fragments of it um, outside of its full potential, and sometimes technology uh, is no magic bullet either but if we don't implement it correctly we actually go backwards it's a retrograde step uh, we can lose optimization we can lose efficiency um, and just ticking a box because it's the newest thing it, it sounds quite paradoxical but just ticking the box because it's the newest thing doesn't mean that it will be implemented in the manner it maybe should be implemented in as well so Hopefully that sort of encapsulates an, an abstract view of, of the technology and application. Um, and when we when we look at it on the ground, that that really comes out with um, the, the the potential and meeting the potential of what the technology can offer us. So this will go all the way down to the the, the consumer, as I call it. So the end user of the technology, um, you know, if this is logistics, it's it's the um, driver in the cab, it's the it's the operator on the machine, it's the, it's the person that, at the desk putting the input into the into the console. That level of um, consumer interaction is is key to get a handle on from from your business perspective to be able to implement and maximize your your throughput and an opportunity to to even have that technology on board that's very really interesting i particularly like your comment around possibly going backwards if not used correctly but one element i'd like to uh, just touch on because your your area of speciality or your focus of your phd is is on on vehicles and 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 to a certain, a certain extent automation so how would that optimize or, or create an optimal efficiency within a supply chain, particularly where maritime and, and land-based transport meet? Uh, how does automation really contribute to it? Okay, yeah, well, really you sort of get into the uh, high-speed data transition, really, that's, that's the thing. You know, where um, in the past, uh, we, we have a paper trail for things. We're now into this digital trail for things. We can we can um, we we can prepare ahead of something happening that we know is coming along. For example, a certain way bill landing, whatever it might be. So that sharing of information at, at, at lightning speed um, is really the the the, the key um, to optimizing those kind of systems because. The two can talk to one another in real time. They can iron out problems, faults, and and prepare for uh, whatever eventuality may be um, coming their way, so to speak. So, it's it's really uh, the speed of data transfer, that communication. So that the the delay that was previously in in inherent old systems or paper trail systems um, can be ironed out really and, and dealt with at the source quite quickly. So that, that may be a, a customs clearance. It may be, you know, um, uh, transferring the information from a way bill um, to, to being able to check a manifest. But, but being able to do all that at, at lightning speed is really what, what, what brings your uptime and your optimization up. So what would you say are the barriers currently facing particularly uh, port operators and 
and, and logistics providers. So, uh, you know, one of the comments has been that uh, there's been a silo, a siloing effect within within the digitalization process. Would you agree with that as as, as a caricature that that it's a a a barrier? And and what other barriers are there? Uh, it's it's an interesting question, Andre. The the human element really comes back into this, I guess. There's, there's a certain element of, um, you know, in, in a way, almost change management, behavioral psychology taking shape. It, it kind of touches on several areas because um, people are, we're, we're repetitive creatures, you know, we're, we're creatures of habit. And when things move as fast as they are doing in the digital space and the IoT space, um, you know, if you, if you look at the last, um, I don't know, take, for example, hypothetically 10 years and look at the previous 10, look at the differences that happened in the, in the, in the, the nearest 10 years to that it, it's, it's huge. Um, and that's set to continue. So the changes are coming faster and faster. So that's difficult, uh, for organizations to reposition themselves to, um, one, make the best strategic decision in terms of where they're going with implementing this technology um, because of course the, the inherent problem with technology is it, it it's getting out of date quickly too but also you need technology that's um, uh, interconnected and compatible for for things like the iot to be functional and you don't want those sort of roadblocks where oh, their system doesn't talk to our system and that kind of aspect because you really haven't you haven't implemented an optimized system. It's it's become that silo that you're talking about there. So it's it's having that um, boundary spanning uh, transmission of information between different modes, um, it, different different um, uh, different different facilities, and different logistics providers that really can can bolster up the optimization of all involved not just not just one party it's it that's the thing sharing data is is not just giving away your your data to somebody else it's it's it should be a two-way path and you end up um enhancing your own optimized system as well so it, it's it's you all grow and learn together is, is the is the message in that i would say that's very very interesting insights uh, are, are often particularly within the trying to prepare for this particular program uh, have, have had a number of port operating systems or port operators saying is that they are uh, they are reluctant to share uh, some of their ideas and concepts because uh, it's the intellectual property so so i think what you are saying if i understand you correctly is that what the participants in the digital supply chain and particularly when you look at the internet of things and going forward there should be a greater generosity in terms of data sharing now, now, how would that data sharing take place? Uh, in, in what context do you mean, Andre? Well, a lot of the fears and concerns raised, particularly with import operating systems, is safety and security. So how can mm. I securely have my system, say I'm a port of Rotterdam, uh, wanting to have a digital interface and communication and data exchange, say, with the port of Fremantle? What, uh, what am I going to be doing or, or how am I going to achieve that? Um, well, in terms of, of, of data security, obviously that, that's paramount for, for, for everyone, um, for sure. And, and it's not just, um, it, you know, the, the um, one port talking to the next port or, or one logistics provider talking to the next one. It's really um, to protect them from external threats. And, and you, you sort of drift into the, the cyber security aspect there in a, in a, in a, in a big way because I think this is important, you know, in our daily lives, in our personal lives, we, we, we can be vulnerable to that um, because everything is so connected. And I guess in a way we have to be conscious that we don't become um, complacent at that as well. And certainly in our places of work, it's important for, for, for all the partners involved to realize that they're only as, uh, as strong as the weakest link in that chain. And, and in an in a IoT system where information is, is shared seamlessly through different departments and, and organizations, that that's critical. So we're back to that point of sharing knowledge and strategy 
um, becomes the, the way to be able to share information in a concise and secure manner, because you can all be on the same page and have the same um, idea, because that threat is very real for all partners, all parties involved. And I think you really have to, um, without going into the technical details of it, you really have to get that strategy right to start with so that you're, you're all singing from the same sheet, basically, um, end up working together. Alex, look, I really appreciate your insights and, and for taking the time to have a chat to me. I think uh, based on our, dis our, our discussion, uh, a key takeaway is really that an, you know, the various port operating systems need to be able to exchange information and data in real time, effectively and efficiently in order for them to work and optimize supply chains. So thank you very much, Alex. I really appreciate it. And I hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you, Andre. Thank you. Welcome back. It's my privilege to invite and, and introduce Biju Kualaram, who is the Chief Digital and Transformation Officer for Transformation Core, based in Long Beach, California. His previous experience is Chief Digital Officer for Agility Logistics and has a keen interest in, in data technology and, and digital transformation within the supply chain and logistics frameworks. Um, Perhaps the way to start, uh, Bijou, is, 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 is one of the complex issues or complex questions asked by many people is what's the differentiator between data and technology? How do those two elements within a digital supply chain, how do they work and how does it impact on, um, on supply chain and particularly within a, 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 a port system or, or a rail system? Great. Uh... Great uh, question, Andre. Thanks. Um, I the I think that the, the way to visualize this and conceptualize this is um, I, I have a framework within which I recommend that organizations, particularly uh, network type industries and supply chains and the forwarding industry and the shipping industry, the port based ecosystem, if you like, is primarily a, a prime example of what a network uh, business looks like, a network ecosystem, right? So the way I recommend that people look at this is in four components. Um, first of all is for each player within that ecosystem, what is the business transformation opportunity? Second, what is the culture and the organization? And third and fourth, to your point, differentiating between data and technology. So. Um, traditionally, and I've been doing this for 30 years now, traditionally, we've tended to conflate data and technology together in the bucket of systems. Um, but what I think has changed considerably in the last, uh, last seven to eight years and now accelerating is this concept of data 
and you know the expression um if i hear it again it's 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 so cliched but it's it's summed up really well data is the new oil um and i think the way to look at it is that technology is these days a commodity it's the scaffolding it's the software it's the hardware most of which is now available as a service so that initial corporate investment required to make a lot of expenditure in what was called the tech stack and still is called the tech stack, the actual components. Um, I think that is diminished. And what I'm now urging organizations to do is to differentiate between data, which is the value that comes from uh, the technology and the technology itself, which is an enabler. So. Uh, I think that where the ecosystems and the networks and the supply chains in particular and digital transformation within those are heading is towards closer and closer cooperation between players. I think that's made more easy now with data exchange. And I think controlling your data, exchanging your data and managing your data is a bigger issue, bigger challenge and really a bigger priority than worrying about the technology. So I think differentiating between the two is pretty crucial. Look, I, I, I find that a really interesting and helpful differentiation between the two. As, as, as you're speaking about the data side of, of, of business, what are some of the issues that are currently being confronted by people in, with regard to data exchange and, and interoperability with the data? Oh, um, so, you know, given that we're talking about data within, um, I'm sorry, I use, I use, I, uh, I've lived here for 20 years, so I tend to use data more than I use data, although, uh, uh I'm from Australia, <laughs> so I should, I should use data more, uh, but they've, they've succeeded okay. in, uh, they've succeeded in chiseling that out of me over the last 20 years. So, yeah. <laughs> um, the, so the data, um, challenges that I think this ecosystem or network of players uh, faces today is first and foremost it's got to be security um, it's got to be security um, that's high up items number one two and three in the minds of everybody but that security comes from two aspects it's not just about whether or not my data is protected it's also whether or not my data has integrity and the reason that the second one is really crucial, particularly in supply chain, is this. Um, we're heading towards a world where a high degree of automation is going to do things like smart contracts. So basically, um, if we have an event that is triggered, a track and trace event, for example, and that event is triggered by an automated uh, passage of freight from one stage to another, and that in turn triggers some sort of billing or it triggers some sort of um, customs entry or it triggers something of that nature, then you've got a situation where you want to make sure that you can trust that data. Um, so you can't afford to have errors. You can't afford to have too much human intervention. You can't afford to have too much. It's got to be passage of the passage of data from one player to another has to happen at such a high automated level and at such a secure level that the trust is ensured. So if I had to summarize it, I would say trust in the um, uh, veracity of the data. And the second is in the security and making sure that only the people that need to look at the data get to look at the data. Do you think we will eventually get to some form of common data standard? Uh, because because uh, listening to you sounds like data becomes a central element in, in, in terms of optimizing the supply chain, but also in terms of, of, of um, interoperability of systems, but also data exchange. Yeah, great point. So I've long held the view that um, a lot of standards um, are, are a crucial part, right? So if you look at historically, we've had trouble in the industry in general with the establishment of standards. And those standards tend to have come from, um, from large players, what I call the hubs, um, basically demanding that the trade and the relationship happen in a certain way. 
So take uh, just just worthwhile taking a quick historical perspective. Um, you know, I was in uh, Australia in the um, late 80s, early 90s, when Australian customs, to its credit, adopted a very early um, uh, approach to requiring the manifest lodgement electronically. And what that did was it forced shipping lines and forwarders and others to say, well, if we're going to send the manifest electronically, what else can we do with this? And that led to a whole lot of questions about standards. And then we went to Edifact and then we went to EDI and then it became a, you know, how do we, and of course, since then we've exploded in the technology underpinning because now we've got XML, which is driven by the internet. Um, but I think that um, those standards are going to continue to evolve. In the US, for example, we still use ANSI for data exchange, uh, the American National Standards Institute. Right. And some of these are so heavily embedded in the legacy systems that it's hard to move away to a non-proprietary standard. And that's why I think that the more of that hub in, uh, in an ecosystem that comes into play, you know, the Walmarts of this world, the Amazons of this world, the customs organizations of this world, the government agencies, the United Nations, all of them becoming standard setting bodies is where the momentum comes from. The other uh, thing to watch very carefully right now is where blockchain is going. Because where blockchain ends up, and, and blockchain is not so much a standard as much as it is a security, it's a distributed ledger. And it's a technology that makes data more trusted, right? To what I said earlier. So I think that we are going to arrive there, but I think that like most things, technology, we have been arriving there for a number of years. Um, and I suspect that it'll be one of these tipping points, Andre, it'll be, we're here and look, it happened suddenly forgetting that it took 25 years of build up. Uh, but it, it's one of these long-term overnight success things, right? But I, I don't think we're very far away. I think we are actually very close. Yeah, that Go seems ahead. to be. Yeah, that seems to be the general feeling w w within the industry, particularly as the maritime sector is, as uh, and that sounds derogatory, but the maritime sector has suddenly woken up to uh, digital and, and digitalization can actually optimize and and and. and improve capacities and capabilities um so i think that, that that would be driving it just going back to an earlier comment which i was really fascinated with is you mentioned technology being an enabler could you just give a a, a bit more meat around that yeah um so how, to, to put it to put it um succinctly um technology first of all it's seen as a specialist function. I think it needs to be seen as a generalist function because we no longer say finance or marketing or sales are these silos in an organization. So take a typical board meeting, and I, I like to use this analogy, right? Take a typical board meeting and the board is trying to set strategy for an organization and you have the CFO presenting. And then you have the COO presenting, and then you have supply chain, you have marketing, sales, um, but IT tends to be seen as a cost center that is going to be um, uh, that's going to have these big projects. They're going to be long, you know, delivery cycles, and what's it going to cost? It's an investment, and it's seen as a finite amount of money we have to put in towards a finite project. And what I tend to want people to start thinking is slightly differently. Think of it the same way as you think about finance, sales and marketing, which is it's continuous investment. It is an enabler of business transformation. So your, if your business strategy is mergers and acquisitions, then technology is going to enable you to get there, but it's not an end in itself. You know, you hear a lot about technology disruption. And my answer is, towards what end? It's got to be technology enabling your business objective, your business strategy. If that's mergers and acquisitions, then that's what the technology is going to be pointed at. If it's going to be um, 
competitive advantage through better customer journey, then that's where you point the technology at. You know, Amazon points its technology at fantastic customer experience and monitoring how the customers interact. So it's not a technology for technology's sake. It's not a technology for investment. It's not a technology for a necessary evil. My God, um, it's a it's an enabler and not an end purpose in itself. Look, I think that's a, a, a really important clarification because in my own mind, I see technology as giving life to data. Um, it makes the data meaningful it, and, 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 it, and it shouldn't be the technology driving the data acquisition. It's the, the data, what you want to do with it, that drives the development of the technology. And I yeah. think there's been a gradual recognition of that within our industry. And particularly within port operating systems and terminal operating systems where they're now seeing the advantages of saying, yes, we have the data, let's get the technology of the system to actually operationalize it more effectively. And that is to, to improve capacity and optimize our supply chain. It's very well put. I mean, take, uh, to extend on what you just said there, take robotic process automation. Um, you know, it's the same thing. Robotic process automation is a technology, but it's furthering the quality of data, which is the end purpose, mm. right? So it's, it's, it, it's, that's why technology is enabling rather than an end, yeah. end, end yeah. purpose. Yeah. And yeah, Bijou, look, I really do appreciate your time. And I know it's, it's late in the evening in your part of the world. Um, look, I found your, I found the discussion really, discussing re, really insightful and, and you've made some tremendously strong points. So I'm sure the audience will have got a lot out of, uh, of some of your commentary and, and insights. So Bijou, thank you very much. Really much appreciate it. Thank you, Andre. I appreciate the questions. Welcome back to the show, and I, I'm pretty in, excited to be talking to Sylvia Wong, who's with Hatch Digital and is principal for Smartport, Smartports and Terminals. She's been responsible and involved in TREPAC and the APM terminals at the Port of LA, and works at integrating systems, mainly to operationalize automation and container systems. She's also co-author of, of Chapter 5, of the report planning for automation and container terminals. Sylvia, welcome back, or welcome to the show. <laughs> I shouldn't say welcome back, it's, it's your first time. I really do appreciate your time and, and, and I'm looking forward to some of your, your insights, uh, particularly from an operational perspective. And perhaps to, to kick the discussion off, I, I, I'd like to touch on, the, on what is it, mean when people say optimal digital supply chain needs port operating systems to interface with terminal operating systems is that realistic or what are the issues around that well thank you for having me here um andre um you know i i think really in order for um 
to move cargo like everything else and to, and to optimize. Um, the more forward information the parties have, uh, the better it is. So if we look at um, the port as an ecosystem and um, when we arrive a vessel, what's involved, it's having the foreknowledge of when vessels are arriving, what cargo is on board, um, and then also when trucks are coming, having having some abil ability to see when trucks are arriving, so that um, so that the the cargo they're going to pick up is ready, um, and also if anything is being um, being moved by on dock rail, having um, insights into um, what what cargo is coming for as an export from from the rail and what imports those uh, rail cars are going, going to take away and when they're needed. So understanding and being able to coordinate um, information about when those um, other partners are going to be arriving at the terminal um, have a significant impact on the ability to be optimized and effectively operate the terminal in, in everything from how containers are stacked within the yard, yard management strategy to, um, to when they, how they are staged and, and when they are, um, how, how they're planned for discharging off of the vessel to loading onto the, to the rail car. So it's really about moving smoothly and making use of the space that that the terminal has within um, within the yard, um, and and utilizing the equipment in the most effective way. So the more for, foresight information they have on on what's coming, um, the better. And 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 also you know on the maintenance side, um, having the ability and insight into understand and coordinate maintenance, um, because especially at um, in some of the terminals at the Port of LA, a Long Beach, um, you know, where the the um, the port is responsible for maintaining certain infrastructure within the within the terminal um, and and perhaps some equipment as well. Um, it's really making sure that the the outages are coordinated um, and that there's monitoring to ensure um, that preventative maintenance can be done with minimal downtime. That, that's that's really fascinating. In, in particular, the whole concept of a, of an ecosystem uh, and a port ecosystem. Now, your speciality is really been on the uh, terminal operating systems. Now, when you're designing and developing a terminal operating system, what factors do you look at from a look at from a design from a design perspective when looking as a, at, at a port partner? What are some of the issues that you have to overcome? There are quite a few um, incumbent terminal operating systems on the market. There are some, um, some of our clients do develop in-house terminal operating systems. So they're, they're quite bespoke. Um, so the, the challenge is understanding how these systems can integrate because you'll have systems at your gate. So those would be your gate operating systems um, to, to um, track the arrival of um, of trucks and the cargo that those that that the trucks are bringing in, and also um, as trucks leave, what, what cargo is leaving. Um, those systems need to be integrated with the terminal operating system, which um, has uh, information about um, the containers themselves, uh, who owns the container, what's inside, uh, where the containers are going, when they're meant to be picked up. Um, and by by whom, um, and these terminal operating systems may also have information about, um, or would likely have information about the equipment it, itself, and uh, provide instructions to the equipment um, or to the operators of the equipment of uh, what to do with the containers. So, giving lists of um, to the um, giving lists to the, the crane drivers on the ship to shore cranes um, when to take containers off of um, a vessel um, and which ones to load, how to stow the containers in which bays. 
Um, and similarly, um, on the other side, on the on the train side, a, a similar process to that. So providing the instructions. So the ability to integrate um, and partition functionality in a way that is um, in a way that is uh, logical for the operation is really important. And the ability to for the systems to work in a way that supports the operational scenarios and not just for the individual silo of of, of, um, of a piece of equipment, that's really important because all the pieces of equipment have to work um, as a process, not as individual silos. Okay. Does that? But, yeah, no, that, look, 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 that's very fascinating because uh, the one thing that I have found in my discussions and, 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 and my travels, so to speak, is this idea of the data silo and, and integration of data. Uh, now, how do you go about integrating it? Or what is the main issue? Now, what I've heard from a lot of people saying there's not sufficient data standardization that allows for optimal integration. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. So there's there's several layers to that question. There's I, I, I guess that or my my um, opinion on it is is um, I, I come from a process engineering background um, and um, I've worked in mining. And I think the standards in other industries and with other systems, it's a little bit clearer. Um, there are standards like ISA 95, for example, which articulate um, where uh, system boundaries should be in terms of functionality and given the, the time horizon needs for the data. So as an example, if you have an onboard sensor or onboard, um, onboard control system, the data would be coming out fast and furious in the in the millisecond range. Um, as you move further up the chain into planning or trans, more transactional data, you might have data that's required only hourly or by shift. So understanding understanding the standard of of what functionality should reside in which layer of system is important. But on the on the data side per se, so um, you know on the data side. There is very little standardization um, in terms of how data should be exchanged and how it should be um, how it should be um, exposed and consumed. And so this was a, um, a challenge that we actually faced when I was working with a client. Uh, we were commissioning their automated um, on dock rail um, cranes, and one of the things that we noticed was that you know. It, in this industry, it's um, it may not be um, um, common to have a standardized data reporting mechanism. There might be a lot of collecting of data and there might be a lot of producing of data, but data is not shown in a way that allows um, somebody who's trying to analyze a problem to see the data within the context of the duty cycle of what the crane was trying to do. So you might get um, a lot of uh, data that is disparate in log files, or you might get a lot of data that shows a uh, very detailed um, millisecond um, data that, that might be produced, and you might even have a system that collects it. But the challenge is then understanding, well, what was that, that piece of equipment trying to do? What were all the systems that are involved in moving that piece of equipment and giving that piece of equipment instructions, what were they doing? Um, and then what was the end result in order to see um, to, to see how all those different pieces of data fit in to provide uh, the story about what was actually happening. Do you think we'll ever get a level of, of data standardization that will allow for a, a fully optimal uh, port ecosystem? I think so. There are a number of um, initiatives that um, you know that are being worked on in this um, in in this space in this industry to to progress um, the uh, improvement of of data uh, for optimization. Um, and there are quite a few clients who are. Uh, if uh, when I was at TOC um, this year and also in past years, I know that this is a conversation that a lot of a lot of terminal operators are having, and I think um, that the that the equipment and system vendors 
are, are starting to listen um, and, and starting to um, work on things that are going to enable optimization in, in this area. Yes, Sylvia, I think it, it, it's one of those things where a lot of people complain, particularly from the digital space, that the, the maritime industry particularly is a, is a few years behind the rest of the world as far as digitalization and digital standards come in. Um, so I think, look, I agree that we will, we, we will get there um, and, and, and hopefully sooner rather than later, because supply chains really are impacted at that interface at the port operating system and the terminal operating system. Uh, without an integration at that level, I think supply chains will, 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 will in a sense, forever and a day, have backlogs and, and, and congestion. Um, Sylvia, thank you very much for your time. I really do appreciate your insights. I found them fascinating, but uh, but more importantly, I found I, I learned quite a bit having a chat. So so thank you for your time, and and I look forward to chatting to you in the future. Thanks for having me. That was another episode of our look into digital supply chains. I do hope you found this this episode that took a closer look at operating systems within the port and terminal operating systems, both informative, but more importantly, it gave you some ideas, new ideas that you could possibly look at when implementing your own digital supply chain strategies. From me, sincere thank you for watching, and I look forward to sharing some more along the digital supply chain.